scripture comes from Luke chapter two, chapter one. I'm sorry, um, and there's there's two gospels that that have the the birth story, um, Luke and Matthew. Uh, in John, we we read about kind of the concept of what it meant that Christ came to earth. Um, but the birth story in Luke and Matthew is just beautiful. Matthew tends to focus on, on the, the coming of the wise men, um, whereas Luke focuses on Mary. Matthew focuses on Joseph. Luke focuses on the journey and the spirituality and, and just that emotion and that experience that Mary felt. And then um, it talks also about the shepherds later, and we'll read that on Christmas Eve. But this, today's passage, is where Mary finds out she's going to have a baby. And I want you to take, just for a moment, guys, put yourself as if you're Joseph, and what you would do if your wife came to you and said, hey, guess who said I'm going to have a baby? And ladies... Put yourself in those shoes. If an angel came to you and said, you're going to be pregnant, and you'd be like, uh, what? Wait a second. And hear the words that the angel says as if he's speaking them to you. This is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered, What kind of greeting could this be? But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How can this be? Mary said to the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be barren, is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me, as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Dear gracious Lord, Holy Spirit, wow, what an imagery. What a, a concept of what's going on there. Father God, we, in many ways, sit in Mary's shoes and wonder what's going to happen in this world. We, we, we see things and we get scared and, and we're waiting for you to say, do not be afraid. I got you. Nothing's going to happen that I am not a part of. Holy Spirit, as we look at the words Gabriel said to Mary today, as we explore this spiritual journey she went on, as we explore the emotional journey she went on, may we find our self in the story. And may we learn to embrace your peace and not be afraid. Holy cleansing Lord, may it be your words that are heard today and not mine. Father, may it be your way that we follow and not just our own. 
Amen. As the praise band and I discussed earlier, we were, we're, we're all dragging a little today. So if I'm a little slow or I fall asleep on you, I'm sorry. I think I'm, I'm concerned I might be getting a little bit of a head cold. So earlier this week, I saw a video um, online on Facebook that I couldn't download. I couldn't get it downloaded. So I want to describe it to you. It was a video um, uh, uh, from Spain, and so you were going to have to read the subtitles. But the video was of this one company had, had interviewed all these parents and said, what are your hopes for your kids? What, what are the things, what are the, the hopeful things you have for them? What are your dreams, and, and what do you think about the world that's coming, that, that, that they're going to get to inherit? And every parent couldn't express anything of great hope. They said, you know what, I don't know. I'm scared. There's so much hate and anger and war going on. Some were talking about how, they said, you know, I, I'm watching the pollution increase and I'm watching this world just, we're, we're not taking care of it. Others said, I am scared that my kids are going to live in a police state. And they began to talk about their fears and their emotions and their worries and their, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I have hope for my kids. I love them, but I just don't know. And they began to talk as the video continues about their worries. And then the video transitions into their kids. And the same company had gone to... Uh, interview the kids separate from the parents and the parents get the chance to watch their kids and they ask the kids what are your hopes what do you want to be when you grow up what are your dreams for the future and the kids began to say one goes I'm going to be an artist I'm going to make things I'm going to create and another one says I'm going to be a doctor because I want to heal people. I want to help people. Another one says they want to be a soccer player. And they go on and on. And these kids who are caught in this world that their parents just described don't see the brokenness. They see the possibility. And the parents, you watch on the video, the parents weeping. Weeping over the fact that their kids, who they thought were living in a world where there was no hope, had nothing but hope. These kids said to their moms and dads, I believe this world can be better. I believe there is the possibility of peace and hope in the way they talked about their dreams. And I watched that video and I cried myself. Because I thought, I feel that same way. I look at the world and I see all the brokenness. I see the hurt and the hate. I see the anger. I see the fact that somebody out of hate decided to go shoot up a place in California. And then in response, somebody decided to go burn a Muslim mosque. I don't know if you heard that this week, but somebody decided to firebomb a mosque because they were mad about the San Bernardino thing. And I ache because I'm angry that hurt, hate does not heal hate. You don't attack somebody else simply because they attacked you. And I see these things in the world and I feel like that parent, even though I'm not a parent of a person, I am of a dog now. <laughs> and to him, everything is great as long as I'm home. And I see that and I feel like those parents and I say, God, can there be peace? Can there be hope? Can there? And then I look at our kids. And I see the joy and the laughter. And I believe there can. Then I see, I see the look on the face of the men and women at the toy giveaway saying, thank you. You gave me hope that it could be a little better this year. And then I see the fact that this community will come out in droves to care for others. And I say, maybe there is. And then I reflect on Mary. You see, Christ came into the world as a child at a time not unlike ours. 
You see, the world we live in now, where we might feel like it is all collapsing and falling apart, is is the same kind of conflicts that have been present and spiritual brokenness that has been alive and around ever since the first human took the first breath. You know, we don't didn't emphasize it there in, in the reading earlier, but it talked about how Cain, Cain and Abel are, are Adam and Eve's children, according to scripture. And, and Cain is, we said, Cain turned from the, the light and Abel embraced it. Literally what happened is they were brothers that were fighting and Cain, Abel Excuse me, Cain murdered Abel because they disagreed over land ownership. So from the very beginning, this brokenness and spiritual and emotional hate and hurt that we see at present in the world today, that we see countries warring over, that we see people fighting over, was there. And God has always been involved in trying to heal it and saying, here's my light, here's my hope, here's my peace, take it, and saying you have the choice to embrace it or not. And so it was that kind of culture, that kind of world in which Mary existed. Now, we'll take a moment, let me paint a, a picture here. So, Mary is a young woman, and we've always emphasized, many people always emphasize her, her youngness, her teenagehoodness. But if we keep in mind, until recently, you were married by 2021. Until the last 50 years. Obviously, I missed that mark. But you know, whatevs. Um, but you were married very young. I mean, even go back to our grandparents, maybe our great-grandparents, they were most likely married by 18, if not sooner. And it wasn't looked down on as much. So the fact that she was young, important to note, but not as important as maybe we would think today. And so here's this young girl. And she lives in a small village. Nazareth is, is itty bitty or up there in Galilee. And, and, and it's, it's probably, I'd say, let's say Fort Supply. It's just a small town. Most of the people that live there are construction workers. They're carpenters. That's why, obviously, that was the trade that Joseph had. And, and they are most likely working at this time. They are probably all Jewish citizens that have now been, they are occupied by the Roman government. They are living under the oppression of the Roman government, who is saying, you can continue to live on your land as long as you pay us tribute. As long as you do what we say, we won't kill you and give us plenty of money. Just FYI. That's the same thing that ISIS is doing in the Middle East. They are threatening to kill people if they don't pay tribute and taxes. Say, so we'll let you live as long as you pay us money. And as soon as you don't pay the tax, they'll kill you. And so that's kind of why they're able to take, they, they, they've, they've taken over certain areas. Just, FY, just to kind of give you that connection in the two cultures. And so here's Mary living in this world. They're trying to make ends meet. They have to pay out taxes. They're most likely, as carpenters, this whole community is being forced to work to rebuild some sort of Roman something in a neighboring town. And they are being, if not forced labor, at least being paid, but, but it's not labor that they're choosing. They're kind of, again, one of those, well, you can work for us or you can work for us type things. And so there they are, in the midst of all this, and it is getting more and more difficult with every moment. There's the Pharisees who are saying, hey, look, guys, let's just bow our heads, do what they say, eventually they'll go away. There's the zealots who are saying, pick up arms, let's go kill all the Romans in the name of God. And then there's the everybody else. Mary's one of the everybody else's. She says, look, I just, I don't want to live like this anymore. But I don't feel it's right to kill. And they have reached a point, the whole culture has reached a point at which, they're at that breaking point. They're at that point where they, they, they know that going to war with Rome to set themselves free is not, is not a viable option. But they also know that maintaining this kind of situation is not healthy either. <clears throat> they also know that there's more to this than simple territorial fighting. There's more to this whole situation. Most of all, God knows this. 
You see, God sees that the reason why the Roman government has controlled these people is because the Roman government is broken. The people running it and leading it are spiritually broken and they are focused on territorial gain. They're focused on, on, on spiritual and emotional oppression and control. And while at the same time that they have that struggle going on, they also, God also knows that, that the Jewish people are broken and are needing hope. They're needing something more than just f turning the tables and putting the Jewish people on top and the Roman people on bottom. They're needing peace. They're needing relationships to be restored. They're needing hope. They're needing to know that I can learn to love my enemy. I can learn to grow closer to God through following His way. And so Christ comes. God comes and He says, here is this one young woman. And I think there is a, a significance, the, the significance to the youthfulness of her is that she hasn't dealt with enough of the brokenness and the corruption of the world to be discouraged. Her heart isn't cynical yet. I don't know about any of you, but sometimes I feel like my heart can be a little too cynical. And I spend time with a kid and I realize, you know, there's better things in this world. And so God says, I'm going to come to you, Mary. And you're going to give birth to my peace. You're going to give birth to the love of God. You're going to bring the wholeness. And you see, the thing is, Christ knew it wasn't about a warrior king who goes out and defeats everybody. It was about a warrior prince who loved and gave passion and compassion and restoration and hope and healing and brought humanity, both enemies and, and friends together and created a space for hope and healing. And so God says, through the hope of an innocent heart, I'm going to bring that. And he says five things and three of them all kind of go together. But he says, he, he says these things to Mary. Because you see, Mary is, is terrifying. I mean, she's living in a world where, where it can be, it's just scary. Kind of like those parents who say, I don't know if I have hope. She's just living in this, this difficult world. And the first words out of the angel's mouth are, do not be afraid. Now, obviously, part of that is kind of like there's this big angel hovering over you in the room, and I would be scared, maybe have wet my pants or something even. I'm like, I, 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 I actually think if the angel showed up and my bedroom buddy would look up, and, okay, I'm going back to sleep, because that's kind of how he is right now. And there he is. Of course, she's scared of that, but there's another piece to this. He's saying, do not be afraid. Don't be fearful that whatever is happening is out of God's control. You see, those are the words. If, if he's saying to Mary, I got you. I feel like he's saying the same thing to us. That we cannot live in a world of fear. That if we want to bring about peace, we cannot be controlled by fear. And so he says to Mary, do not be afraid. I got this. This is God. And he says to us, do not be afraid. This world may be difficult. This world may be dark right now. But I got this. I'm in control. The next thing he says is a child is going to be born to you. And you're going to name him Jesus. And he is the son of the most high God. And he will take the throne of David. Now, the first thing that you're hearing there is that he is God's son. So that means that God, who is coming down encased in skin, you don't need to be afraid because this is God. This is the one who created it all. God is greater than the brokenness in the world. And he's taking David's throne. You see, to the Israelites, David was the ideal. 
David was supposed to be the ideal king, but he failed at that. And so God is saying, look, I'm going to come and be that ideal, peace-filled leader for you again. And so he says, don't be afraid. Know that I am greater than the brokenness in this world that you are facing. Don't be afraid that because I'm going to tell you you're going to be pregnant. Don't be afraid that your husband is going to go away from you. Know that I will not do something, will not let something happen to you that will cause you to, to fall apart in a way that I can't pick you back up. And he says, then, then know that it is God who is in control of this. It is God who is on the throne. It is God encased in skin who is taking over. And then last he says that he will take over and he will bring his kingdom forth. And that kingdom will never end. You see, God says those same things to us today. He says that we need to not be afraid of the brokenness in the world that we are facing. For God is greater. Remember, I preached on that in August and September. That we are to live lives that are greater than the pain and the brokenness in our world. We're to live as if God is greater than that. As if existing in this world, as if embracing God's love is greater and has more control over us than the fear. We have great ability to give in to fear quickly. And I'm watching it happen around our world. But if we truly believe that God is greater, that His kingdom is greater, then we won't embrace it. And the way we can know what is greater than all this pain is by reading through the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 through 7. Because that's where Christ describes His kingdom that will never end. He says that His kingdom that will never end is full of peacemakers. It's full of the meek, of the compassionate, of the mercy-filled people who seek to love their enemies and build their life upon that. You see, to Mary, Christ was physically going to be born. We get the chance for him to be born in us today. Every day. Every moment of the day, Christ's love can be reborn in us. And Christ wants us to remember, do not be afraid. Let my life be reborn in you. Let my love be reborn in you. And let my kingdom live through you. For if we want to bring about peace and overcome the fear in this world, then it comes through His rebirth in us every day. Christmas is about peace. Christmas is about hope. You see those kids in that video, they saw that. They knew that there was something new, something hopeful. And they changed the world for their parents by saying that. Are you ready for Christ to be born in you? Are you ready for His peace to be what drives you? Are you ready to take the words that Mary says at the end of this dialogue with the angel? Are you ready to be his servant? To not be afraid? To trust that his kingdom will reign? And to follow his love forever? I hope to be. I hope you will as well. Amen.